Let's get started. Um, thank you so much for coming. I am Hilary Chute. Uh, I am a comic and graphic novel columnist for the New York Times Book Review. And I'm also the author, oh, the mic is sitting on it, most recently of this book, which is called Why Comics? From Underground to Everywhere. And this should be, thank you. <laughs> be for sale at this um, I brought, table I brought them here. or via Millionaire Picnic and Tony Davis. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I just want to mention at the outset that this book features a chapter on comics and sex that heavily um, engages the work of Robert Crumb. And I wanted to show you also, this is a cover that Crumb did for a special issue of a journal that I co-edited in um, 2014. So I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel today. And I wanted to give everybody a heads up at the outset that we will be showing some images by Robert Crumb that have been considered offensive in order to um, discuss them and debate them. So everyone should be forewarned of some of the content of the images. Now, just a really brief bit of context about this panel, and this is something we can take up more in the Q&A if people are interested. So part of the motivation for this panel came out of a conversation that I had um, after last year's MICE with um, Dan Major, uh, one of the organizers of the show. So this is, the MICE program rooms layout map for 2017. And you can see here we have the Crumb Room, here we have the Bechtel Room, here we have Ducey Hall, and the Eisner level. Now I think as many of you know, um, MICE decided to change the name just this past year of the Crumb Room. So as you will all see in your program if you have it handy, if this is last year's, this year we have the Crumb Room swapped out for now what is called the Hernandez Room. So it's exactly the same except for the Crumb Room is now the Hernandez Room. Now, this is a potentially controversial choice. Um, uh, so there's more to say about that in the q and if people are interested. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about this morning, thinking about this panel, is, you know, what are some of the differences between Crumb and the Hernandez brothers, who I assume are being referred to collectively <laughs> in the Hernandez room? Um, Gilbert Hernandez, for example, has um, published pornography, um, as has <laughs> Robert Crumb. There's a lot of attention to women's bodies in Hernandez's work, as there is in Robert Crumb, there's a lot of that sort of unfettered id conversation um, swirling around the Hernandez brothers' oeuvre as there is in Robert Crumb. So it, it's something to think about. Um, it's also worth noting that um, Will Eisner, for whom the Eisner level is named, um, certainly has created some characters that people have been offended by, like the character um, called Ebony White who was the um, sidekick of uh, the superhero The Spirit in the 1940s, um, uh, drawn in a very heavily racially caricatured way. So this choice motivated this panel and the conversation that Dan had with me and with many others um, about this change. Okay, so now to the um, introductions of our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm going to read them in alphabetical order. I want everybody here to know that when our conversation actually starts starts happening, you do not have to go down the line. I hate panels in which um, you know the moderator throws out a question and just boringly goes down the line. So jump in however you see fit, and please feel free to ask each other questions too. But for the purposes of um, introductions, I'm just going to read these in alphabetical order. So, um, Jessica Campbell, 
is a Canadian artist and humorist based in Chicago, working in comics, fibers, painting, drawing, and performance. She's the cartoonist behind this amazing book, um, which I must have purchased eight copies of so far in my life, um, Hot or Not, 20th Century Male Artists, and XTC69, both from Koyama. She is also the author of the November um, 2017 comics piece called The Bad Behavior of Men in Comics, which appeared on the website Hyperallergic in which elicited a huge response, um, particularly for its take on Robert Crumb. Tony Davis is, um, I'm going to jump in and say, a huge force in the Boston comics community. And as he writes to me for his bio, he has been a comic book fan for five decades. <laughs> Starting with Carl Barks penned Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck Adventures, he and his dad would purchase at the corner store next to the barbershop. In his more than 30 years in comic book retail at the Million Year Picnic in Harvard Square, and this is a picture of some of the stuff. Showing us right here the cover of an art prom book. <laughs> um, uh, he has worn many hats, clerk, the back issue guy, principal buyer, partner, and sole proprietor. Joel Christian Gill is the chairman, CEO, president, <laughs> director of development, majority and minority stockholder, manager, <laughs> manager, regional manager, assistant to the regional manager, <laughs> Senior black correspondent <laughs> of his strange fruit comics. He is the chair of comic arts at the New Hampshire Institute of Art and the author of several books, including Fast Enough, Bessie Stringfield's First Ride from Lions Forge, and the award-winning graphic novels, as, as you can see here in the cover, um, Strange Fruit, Uncelebrated Narratives from Black History, and Tales of the Talented Tenth from Hell from Publishing. R. Sequoia is the author of Masterpiece Comics, Terms and Conditions, the graphic novel, and The Unquotable Trump, all from Drawn and Quarterly. His comics and drawings have appeared in the Best American Comics 2015, Raw Magazine, The New Yorker, Mad, and more. So um, please join me in welcoming start off by asking everybody here about what your experiences have been in your life reading Robert Crumb. So after we talk about this, then, then we'll talk about the debate that this panel is engaging and sort of what the issues are. But before we go right into that, I'd love to know what your experience reading Crumb has been. Well, <clears throat> Crumb for me was, um, I got a degree in painting, so my MFA was in painting. <coughs> and when I decided to go back to school to, when I decided to go, well, actually to go back to school to draw comics, I got a library degree. Is anybody familiar with a library degree? <laughs> um, you have a library card and a will to live. Um, and so, um, Crumb was one of those people that, that I came across when I was doing that. And it's one of those things when you first see some of his work, you're like, this is absolutely amazing. And then I saw Angel, Angel Food and Spade. <laughs> so, and I was like, oh, so there's also this. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it was kind of, and, you know, and then you further see things like climbing on women and sort of like putting his hands in their mouths. And so it's like, it's like, yeah, this is, this is like, it, it was like, it was like, this is dope, but it's also not so dope. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, it, it, you know, I, I could feel like, when, when looking at Crumb's work, it was like this, 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 I mean, even like initially, because I didn't like look at Crumb when I was like a teenage boy. It was like a fully formed, grown man when I was looking at Crumb <coughs> with like expectations of the world. And I'm looking at it and it just, you know, the, you know I'm like technically this is absolutely brilliant, but the work is, is really troubling for me. So it was always sort of a thing like, 
you know, I talked about Chrome with the comic. So for me, it was like discovering Chrome was, was like enlightening in a number of different ways. You can go down there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, when I was a teenager, I worked in a bookstore um, as a, a book buyer um, and a bookseller, and I. Uh, got into comics that way. I never went into a comic book store. It felt like a kind of alien place to me. Um, but they had a couple of graphic novels like Ghost World uh, and Chester Brown's work. Uh, and then one day, we had these remainder tables where we would get you know, books that couldn't sell from the publishers and there was a crumb anthology that one of my coworkers was like, oh, you like comics? You should check this out. He's like, he's really out there. Uh, and my mind was also blown by it. It was like, I've never seen anything that looks like this before. It's like, you know, the drawing is so beautiful, the cross hatching, it's really amazing. Uh, and I th think that, I mean, I don't know, I can talk about my experience reading from for a long time, but I think also reading it, I was like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, like seeing women that kind of look like me and then they're like these very sexualized objects really like imprinted on me, I think, where I was like, I guess I'm like, you know, maybe if I meet Crumb one day, he'll want to like sleep with me or something, or maybe that's like cool, I don't know. And it wasn't until later, I don't know, then, then my feelings over time, I think, uh, you know, seeing things like Angel Food McSpade or um, uh, some of the more uh, rapey Crumb comics, I think, started to shift my thinking over time, um, which we can keep talking about. That's enough. I don't remember the first Crumb comic I read. Um, Your mind was on. Oh, was that not on? Is that what? What? It says it says on. Was yeah, that okay. Oh, is that okay? Uh, so I don't remember the first Crumb comic I read. Uh, I probably first read him sometime in the early '80s. I think I probably discovered him around the same time I discovered Harvey Pekar. Mm -hmm. So um, you sent me a slide. Yes, to I did. Um, and well, well, the reason I wanted to address PCAR was because, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead in the panel, but I'll say this anyway. I was looking at all of his stuff, it always, it all felt alien to me. I mean, it was always incredible to look at, but the sensibility was always something else, even, even to me in the 80s. But um, I would, the one reason I wanted to include this is when PCAR is working in the service of someone else's uh, storyline or someone else's, you know, maybe you could say truth, um, he usually suppresses the parts of himself that I think all of us are a little queasy about. So, for instance, this cover, this is uh, very unusual for an uh, American Splendor issue. I feel like uh, Picard let Crumb put one of his women on the cover. Normally, in the stories that he does with Picard, uh, Crumb is rarely a character, and it's more Picard's everyday experience. And those comics really meant a lot to me in the early 80s. My work is never autobiographical, but I've never seen anyone sort of just deal with the quotidian existence of life the way Picard did. And the best stories in those tend to be the ones that Crumb drew because they really had a sense of the lived-in world. Um, so uh, I could say more, but I think we should keep moving on. OK. Um, so I grew up in Southern California as a pretty mainstream comic book fan. I moved from Disney and Richie Rich on to like Marvel and DC superhero comics. So it was when I moved out here for college and uh, the first time I walked into the picnic was probably the summer of 79. And that's when I was struck by the fact that there was a much larger, broader universe of comics. The picnic had an incredible selection of what existed for underground comics then as well as probably ElfQuest and Cerebus and some new alternative comics. And when I started to work at the picnic, the two founding, of, the two owners at the time, E.B. Bogner and Jerry Reese, were both underground fans, fans of old EC comics like Weird Fantasy and Tales from the Crypt. Um, E.B. Bogner was a close personal friend of the Barks family. So they were into non-mainstream comics, which the store reflected their interest in European comics and other things. And the store had, briefly before I was there, had a small publishing arm called Boatner Norton Press, Norton being Jerry's middle name. Um, so the store had actually published the first price guide for, for underground comics. And the store published the R. Crumb checklist. 
So Jerry was this huge Robert Crumb fan. He had a four-page Crumb original story hanging in the entryway to his, to his home. Uh, probably something I never would have shown my parents. Um, and so I couldn't help but discover Crumb through Jerry, who's a huge fan, who had an enormous original art collection of Crumb. I think at one point he had the third or fourth largest Crumb original art collection in the world. Um, and you couldn't deny the power and the beauty of his art. I mean, that was certainly there. And some of the stories were very incisive. And, and what you said is true. The work he did with Picard was very different. Um, I mean, the funny thing, in particular, by the end of his work with Harvey, the rage you saw was that he really didn't like working with Harvey. He was driving <laughs> crazy, and he was starting to draw Harvey being, you know, further out there and veins bulging out of his head. <laughs> so you couldn't deny that, but at the same time, while I appreciate that, you know, you don't understand from era to era the impact that something had, the way that that San Francisco original underground uh, crew smashed all these barriers and opened all these doors and created opportunities that, say, the Fernandez brothers, Dan Klaus, Peter Bagg, Jim Woodrin era of fan graphics people would enter through, and then Julie Doucet and Chester Brown would enter through, and Raw Magazine would use. Um, the work itself didn't necessarily speak to me. Like, I remember yeah, the first like underground the comic that I read that I connected with was Love and Rockets. And I will say that I always, um, the Jaime work resonates with me more sometimes than Gilbert's work, in part because of some of the things that you talked about, the similarities between Gilbert and, and, uh, and Robert. Um, so, to, so, so to the, the fact that Jaime presented this sort of diverse universe with you know, Hopi and Maggie at its center and them sort of figuring out life and love and relationships in a way that was a little different necessarily from, from, from the world of Robert's Well, maybe this is a good entry point into sort of establishing what the discomfort with Robert Crumb's work has been that has been you know, particularly pronounced in the past you know, five to ten years. Well, I mean, and anyone, feel free. Let's just sort of talk talk about what some of this discomfort has has emerged as. One of the <clears throat> one of the things I was like, so when you look at when I looked at comments when I was first going through it, I didn't always I didn't always read the stories. It was more like trying to figure out technique and trying to figure that out. It was almost until after the fact that I started reading the stories. And so, so you have to think about me when I was looking at Crumb, when I was going through the process of looking at Crumb, I was getting this stuff and I was like, this is technically brilliant. So I look at this and then I look at this image and I look at this image and then Angel Food and the Spade would pop up. And I'm like, that's like, that would, it was like, that would like stop me in my tracks. Like how do I, how do I register that thing? Should we turn to an image that yeah, you sent yeah. me that isn't exactly the character Angel Food and Spade, but is working off a lot of the yes. same um, tropes, it's this image. Yeah. So you run across things like this, and you know, if if you are black in this country, um, like, you know, I, I can look at these things. Like, I can say that I, I love Winsor McKay, but also that the way in which he portrayed black people is problematic. Um, and with Winsor McKay, I at least, at least, that like the very least, the very minimum I can give with Winsor McKay is that that everybody was doing this. Like, this is exactly the way in which we depicted all black people. It was almost like, it was just like, it wasn't even a conscious thought. It was just like, we're gonna do this. You know, Harriman did this, and it's, some people consider him the black, first black cartoonist. So like, that's like, Harriman did this exact same thing. But this is like the height of the civil rights movement when we're talking about race in a very specific way. And like, you know, like people are always whispering at, at like, you know, parties probably in, in Cambridge. People are like, what do you think about the Negro problem? You know what I mean? Like, people are having these conversations and in the process of doing this, he's doing these images that are, that are, that are being put out into the world. And, and I understand the whole like, in and like, I'm just putting out what I'm thinking, but at the same time, like, how do you do this in a world in which Martin Luther King is mar marching on Washington? How do you do this in when we're, when, you know, they're, you know, hosing little girls in a, in a park and they're blowing, like, how do you do this in the same world? And like, 
how do you not have a have a sort of conscious about it? So like this that's the way I sort of came at it. It was like the imagery like it hits me and then that's gonna and no matter who you are, without reading the story and not understanding anything about the context of what he was trying to do, like that's what you get. You get that image and that's overpowering. That image is overpowering than anything else, I think. And I would I would say for me that um, the depictions of black women, Angel Food New Spade and this drawing were bothersome more about gender. Like this drawing is, it, is so over the top of some of the stories that were sort of purely about race but not about gender, like when the niggers take over America. Um, and then this little one panel thing he did, which is a fake ad, um, and it's for Wild Man Sam's canned pure nigger art. Um, both of these works I understand as satire and as a critique of America. The fact that just rawly saying this is how shameful like American corporatism would be. That maybe they won't put these words on a can, but they would certainly come up with this product and sell it if they could. Um, and particularly that when the niggers take over America, which I believe is a, a four-page story, it might be a three-page story, presents every fantasy that white supremacists have about black people. And, and is a companion to yeah. when the Jews take over America. Right, and, 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 and everything, and everything that the, the blacks who are taking over America, who are referred to by just about every black slur that you can think of, everything they're doing in it is something that actually has been done to black people by the majority in America over time. Um, military force, rape, slavery, murder. So I understand those pieces more. Um, when he moves into gym, and I think he comes from a different place. You know, I think from watching sort of the Chrome biopic, when he sort of talks about you know, opening his mind with LSD or whatever, you do understand that certain things come from a place of critique and his whole distrust of the system and his distrust of humanity. The stuff with women comes from a different place, and I think maybe has a slightly different intent, if not a large, a largely different intent. And that's the stuff that I've always found more discomforting. But can I just, kind of to your point about how that image, uh, regardless maybe what the intentions are, it has a certain impact, those stories that you're talking about were reprinted in a white supremacist newspaper, right? Because they're so, the. The satire is so subtle or so ambiguous that it can be like misread as like a, I don't know critique or just a racist screed. I've often been looking for crumb work and gone down the rabbit hole online and found it white supremacist websites to just like end up on in that place. Can I throw out a question that's maybe related? And it's it's about the question of style. Um, and um, in part because I think of Bob's work as um, being so brilliantly able to <coughs> encompass and articulate so many different kinds of comic styles. I'm wondering if any of you think that the satire or just the content of Crumb's work would read differently if he had, say, the style of his wife, Aileen Kaminsky Crumb. Um, or a, a, a less articulated style. I mean, many of you mentioned the like cross-hatching, the sort of the technique. If it had a looser, more cartoony yeah. style, would it somehow um, be received differently? Do you think that style is a part of it? I, and I think that Crumb's virtuosity is the reason why we're still having like these really uh, uh, heated debates about the work. Like, you know, when I made that comic, one of the big critiques was just like, that I can't draw and come, Crumb can draw, therefore I shouldn't be entitled to like, have an opinion or feelings about it, right? Well, so let, let's actually, I have some slides of your comic. Yeah. Let's turn to that in a, in a, in a moment. I'd right. like to hear from everyone, then let's take a look at your comic. Of course, but I mean, I think, but I think that that really impacts how it's received. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, th I think that's totally true. I can't, I can't imagine what style would put across this satire better, but I do agree the lovingly rendered lines give it um, a power, and it's clearly that he really wants to be drawing this stuff, that it's, it, can be, it can be ambiguous. Um, I don't think he's a white supremacist, but there's nothing in that strip. It's, 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 I don't think it's. I don't think it works as satire because there's nothing in the strip 
to let you in on the joke. Now, I love to play things as deadpan as possible, but his stuff is so lurid and sweaty. I don't. I honestly don't know what style would would make the satire work. <laughs> I don't know what style white supremacists don't like that you could <laughs> that you would make it in. Like, oh, I'm not putting that in my comic. Uh, you know, I mean, in, in my in my in my horrible magazine. You know, that's right. what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so you sent me this slide, which I thought was really interesting. And I'm a big fan of Aileen Kaminsky's <coughs> work. I've written about it in my own academic work. And it's interesting because we see his style sort of mashed up with her style because they each draw themselves. In this, right. in this panel, right. so we can get a sort of sense of the difference. Yeah. Do you want to tell me a little bit about why you sent this to? Sure. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> this is a big conversation, and probably we should have had a, like a day long symposium. If people could stand that, <laughs> this kind of moves us away from what we were just talking about. Okay. Well, we can return to it. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to. I'd like to see Jessica's stuff actually okay. for a minute. <laughs> okay, so... Do you, if you don't mind. No, you know, like, it, I don't it's my pleasure. I feel like Tony might have had something to say about this, too. I saw well, you I was, I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> the more powerful the work, the bigger the impact, and it keeps one of the great cartoonists of his generation. So I was trying to think of the Nazi propaganda film made back in the 20s by Rene... Yeah. Again, she's a brilliant filmmaker, which makes the movie more powerful and more insidious in the Um... So I'm sure that uh, white supremacists would have, if he'd been a lesser cartoonist, still referred to the work, but it wouldn't resonate. I guess the moral of that is if Crumb was trash, we wouldn't be talking about him right now. Like, like that, honestly, like... Trash? Yeah. Trash and yeah, like, <laughs> but it wasn't good, but it's, we wouldn't be talking about it. But the question is, like, what do you do when you create something, satire, or whatever, and other people take it over and use it? Um, but in this case, I mean, it's, a, it's more than just a, a, a single drawing or symbol, uh, like the guy whose frog image yeah. was taken by the white supremacy. Yeah. I think it's different well, for that, that guy. Like, I yeah. think that's yeah. different completely. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think, in this, I, I think it's the, 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 per, the role of an artist when you make something is that I don't have to consider what you're thinking. Like, that's just, that's not what you should do. You shouldn't be considering what people are thinking. But you also have to be con conscious of what's going to happen when that goes out to the world. And I think that that's, that's, in, that's in part the problem, right? Because when you read the interviews and what Carl Crum says, it's like, no, 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 that's not, that, whatever, they're, they're not, that's not what I, that's not what I meant. And I'm like, yeah, but you're literally not acknowledging what that work has done to people in a lot of ways. But what's the difference? Do you think he's capable of doing that? No. <laughs> no, but I'm like, but that's a, that's a bigger problem. I, I do. But, but, I think but, he's, per he's an intelligent person. He's perfectly capable of doing but, that. But, but what is the difference between not... Uh, yeah, I, well, I mean, maybe we're going to ask you the same follow-up question. Like, what's the difference between not having the intentions of the audience in mind and being conscious of what the audience? Will well, I mean, I that think, seems like a fine line. Yeah, I think when you look at when you look at work, when you look at art in, in general, you look at you look at Picasso's Guernica, right? Picasso's Guernica, he was not thinking about what people were going to say when they saw it. He was like, I am painting a visceral response to a horrible event. That's what I'm going to do. Right? Or when you look at Madame Matisse's, the portrait Matisse did of his wife, the green line, he wasn't thinking of offending women around the world because he was putting a green line down their face. Um, but when, when people react to that, you actually have to be able to talk about it and actually ask, ask a question. You what mean, Gern account for Yeah, it. account for that. So like what, what Picasso and Guernica, for example, there have been volumes written about Guernica. He changes his mind all the time. But he's willing to engage in that conversation, knowing that people have had that. And it seems like with Crum, he's just now, it's just like, yeah, whatever. It was just what we were doing. I was it was satire. Like I'm not, like he doesn't engage in it in the same way. And um, and I, in going back to that whole idea, though, like I really, really, truly think that if he was garbage, we wouldn't be talking about this. I mean, there are garbage white supremacist comments all over the world. But, but, but can we have a, a just pause for a second yes. and have a, a conversation that, that I think we started having? It was really interesting that I think speaks to your point. But maybe can we articulate what that style is? Because there are people like Linda Berry, right, whose work is incredible, but she has a much different line than Crumb does. So it's not just garbage and not garbage. It's something about the visual ar articulation. And maybe this brings that into Jessica's piece. Well, we don't have to talk about my piece. But I mean, I think with a big part of what the strength of Crumb's work is that he was taking this like forgotten style of cartooning, Bigfoot cartooning, like Seagar and Thimble, Thimble Theater, and then applying contemporary subject matter to it and like drugs and sex and, you know, uh, and it was like this really 
unexpected mashup of these two things that was like electric. Uh, and, and that I think is why you react to this way. Of course he's like a great draftsman, but it's really like this combination of these different cultural factors that makes us, that I think created such a big impact. Of course, before my time a little bit, but that's my feeling about it. Uh, yeah, I think that, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the thing that you brought up. It doesn't seem to be someone who's really capable of sitting down and articulating, talking to criticism that well. I mean, I, I, I sat down and I watched the biopic a little bit last night. And as his brothers described, these har harrowing things that have gone through, yeah. trying to commit suicide, being institutionalized, being on drugs. He laughs most of the time. He just his ability to sort of connect to people talking about discomforting things and pain seems to be missing. So, it, so is it really a question of thought, or is it, he's not a great spokesperson for his own his own art? And, I, and and I'm not saying that that takes away from the offensiveness of some of his art. But if he were more articulate about explaining it, would that make it better? Somehow. I mean, I think it's really tough. I mean, I think it will be tough for us in this conversation. It's tough in general to separate the person, um, which crime can make hard, and the work, um, because from the person has done things that have offended people. Um, but I think it's Andy's in his work. <laughs> Andy's in, in his so work. So much of his work. Right. Right. But I, I think it's quite hard from a film that Terry Zwagoff made about him in the 90s to, to generalize about what he's capable of as a human. So I think him him having a shut down defensive reaction to his family problems, which seem immense, I think is sort of categorically different than his willingness to engage in talking about his work. Because I think one of his attitudes is, I don't need to do this. I don't know if he can, but he often doesn't choose to. But I think that there, I mean, there's also like the it's just lines on fake paper folks kind of attitude yeah. that uh, it's this kind of coyness about the sort of impact that the work has. And if you are critical of the work, or there's been, you know, like um, criticism of his critics for being, uh, you know, humorless feminists or like, uh, yeah, that they're humorless or that they don't get it or that they're yeah. closed minded or they're opposed to free speech or they're censors or something. I, I think we're saying the same thing. He just right. chooses not to engage often. But, but even if he did, would that make the impact of the work and the way the work's used different? Would that make it different for you? I, it's, as a person of, when, when you think about this country being built for and by straight white men of a certain age, it's really easy to just do whatever the hell you want, right? So if you wanna, if you wanna go after it, if you wanna do these things, and so it's easy to just go, I don't have to do that. Right, which is difficult for me as a as a black man now to like I can't separate myself from like I can't separate myself. Like I have to like I can't like I can't set up those same things because no matter what it's gonna be viewed in the like it's gonna be viewed through the lens of 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 who I am. And I think that that blank slate that is that is for straight white men to be able to look in the mirror and see Bob as opposed to a straight white man. I'm looking in the mirror and I see a black man of a certain age. Uh, I think that 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 I think that gives him a lot of <coughs> it gives him a lot of cover to just like not say I don't have to worry about this. I don't have, like I, it gives him a lot of place to just like push that stuff aside and say, oh, you guys are humorous. You don't get you don't get it. Yeah, you don't get it. But you're like the, you're talking. That's you're making depictions of of women, black women specifically, that have that have been brutalized over centuries <laughs> consistently, and we still don't want to talk about it. And but you just like it's just satire to you. I mean, it's just satire. I mean, really, it's just like, that's the way I think of it in my head. When I see it, I'm like, I get that visceral reaction. But I'm also like, these are really, these are really, really fantastic drawings. And I think that that, that connection between, like, <clears throat> it's kind of like wanting to get really close to a painting, you know? Like, it's that kind of thing. So um, let's pause on the concept of satire for a moment, and then let's look at an um, uh, image that Joel, both you and Jessica, um, uh, have pointed out to me um, as one that um, speaks to you in a negative way. But I mean, do all of you on this panel not buy the line that Crumb's work is satirical? Because Joel, it seems like you don't. Tony earlier mentioned the, the sort of biting satire and, and critique 
of America and American racism specifically. So um, what, what do people think? Well, uh, just, yeah, go ahead. I said in some of his work, I can buy that. But there's some work where I don't think it's that hard at all. OK, so, so tell first. me. I, this one's kind of hard, but I, you know, this one, I'm going to pass on this one for, for <laughs> like I said. You can't pass. Well, no, like I said, you know, the work that does involve images of women, the specific two that I mentioned at the, at the front, I can accept more than I can accept something like this. Um, I think, so I, I do think it's satire, but I think satire coming from a place of, of power on the oppressed is a problem. Like, so I do think it's, and I, and I think that's like the crux of the issue, right? You know, it's, it's kind of like a little, ki a little kid telling you, I hate you. And you're just like, you're a little kid. You're not going to do anything about it. And then they're trying to like your mother saying, I hate you. That's a bigger difference. That's a big difference because there's a power imbalance. And so from being part of a, of a group, even, even within the, <clears throat> even within the counterculture, which was had it was was had its problems in and of itself with feminism and racism and everything else, like even within the counterculture, like that even still there is a power dynamic that I think misses the point when you think, oh, it's just sat satire. You people get over it. Oh, but by the way, you've been brutalized for the last 300 years, and we still have an in prison industrial consciousness that does this, and you have this, and you, you know, like you have this, you, you have all these things. But yeah, just, it's just, it, you're snowflake. You know, it's like, it's like, so it's the problem with, I think it's a problem with satire in that respect, that I think satire becomes, it becomes, it becomes a problem when it's a power dynamic. So, because it can still be satire, but what does that satire mean when it's like, I have no power to control that? Uh, the last, speaking of power dynamics, uh, I can't get over an image by Heritage Auctions, AJ.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just lines on paper in an underground comic anymore. Now it's a work of art that an auction house is selling. And I don't know his relationship to this drawing if, if someone bought it from him and then they sold it to the auction house. But crumb is is fine art now, and that totally changes another part of the power dynamic. And I'm not really comfortable with going down that route because I'm not sure what that means. But and I'm not sure. And he might be like, "Yeah, they do whatever they want with my art." Again, he kind of passes it off. Um, so that heritage auctions troubles me on this image as much because of the because of the. Because of the image and the fact that it's like going through this this house now, it's it's this other level. It's another power. Uh, I think it's intended as satire, but I think you also have things like uh, uh, it's intended to be satirical, and yet how many people of color were doing underground comics in his cohort? How many women were in his cohort? Uh, there were female underground cartoonists, of course, and people of color, but not really operating like within, you know, not, not publishing in Zab, for instance. And then you also have things like Dennis the Menace starts running a blackface character in 1973. So, and unironically, unsatirically, it was meant as like this step towards diversity and it's just like, uh, you know, totally misguided. But then you have Crown publishing Angel Food McSpade and saying, or, you know, that being interpreted as satire or some kind of like callback to a forgotten racist past or something that is still very much a part of the present. So um, that comes up in your um, uh, strip, the bad behavior of men in comics. So wh why don't we turn to that? Um, so both um, Joel and Jessica have um, pointed out this particular um, 1988 strip by Robert Crumb called Memories Are Made of This, um, which is titled after a, a mid-50s song, most famously sung by Dean Martin. Um, this is the first page of it. It's a four-page story. Um, and uh, it's about an evening in 1976. So there's a sort of frame narrative that Crumb speaking to the 80s about this evening in, in 76. And so this is um, not coming up that well with the light in here. But um, this is the last page of the strip. And this is the last tier of the strip. And we can um, return to this in a moment. But I want to apologize to Jessica because um, this brilliant piece that she wrote um, called The Bad Behavior of Men in Comics, which online has this sort of title, it seems, called My Body in Comics. Uh -huh. 
but then it has this. The editor changed the title. <laughs> the editor changed the title to the Bad Behavior Pen and Comics. It's vertical, but for purposes of us reading together as a group something quickly that we could discuss, I cut it up and made it horizontal, so I hope you don't mind. But um, these are some of the panels of this strip <coughs> sequence, and I think um, you can all read them. Unless Jessica wants to read them out loud. Okay. <laughs> so this this piece of crumbs, um, memories that are made of this, comes up as you can see in her piece, and she redraws this panel from the final tier of the strip. last year because it was during CAB that this Google Comic, Art. uh, Comic Arts Brooklyn happening next month. Um, it, it, this Google doc had been circulated about this person in the comics community, cartoons and publisher, who had sexually assaulted a bunch of women and there were these women who had um, uh, shared their experiences in a Google document. So kind of what everyone was talking about that weekend, uh, and it was coming on the heels of a number of other kind of uh, surreptitious exposés of men working in media and like magazine publishing and stuff, uh, and whatever, the whole Me Too movement was kind of in, in its uh, uh, climax at that point, or quite a bad word to use here, but. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, I, so I was thinking about that and, and feeling kind of frustrated, and then I was also thinking about you know, this experience I'd had just being a woman working in comics and, you know, coming to work like Art Crumb and thinking, you know, all the, the uh, women who are represented in the comic are, you know, hypersexualized or, you know, anyone who looks like me is like really hypersexualized or being raped or being decapitated or, you know, like all of these things kind of happening. Um, which felt sort of normal to me, and it also felt normal for me to read comics where there were just these really uh, explicit descriptions of like exactly what a woman's body should look like for any particular cartoonist, like how old they should be and how much they should weigh and whatever. And that uh, I was, you know, thinking about that in relationship to actual incidences of assault and violence, and that these things are talked about as being kind of isolated in isolated moments are not related to one another, they can be talked about in that way, and I think it's this insidious form of kind of downplaying these uh, cultural, structural problems that actually are related. Um, so, so yeah, then I wrote the comic and published it pretty quickly, and, uh, and mostly the reception was pretty positive. There were some people who were pretty, who were quite uh, incensed at the comic, specifically uh, the parts where I talk about Crumb. But the comic where I talk about Crumb, I mean this comic that Joel brought up as well, uh, he like rapes a woman in it and it's an autobiographical comic. So even if you want to make the argument that his work is satire or that it's like only lines on paper, I think there's at least this one incident where it really veers into like actual assault. Uh, so I don't know. So that seems like a particularly egregious example of some of the problems with his work in comics. And you had mentioned before that people critiqued your style. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I, I mean, a lot of the criticism, some of it, a lot of it turned into sort of ad hominem attacks. Or I don't know. I mean. I don't know. I mean, the, it just kind of ran the gamut from like, I can't draw, or I'm stupid, or I don't have a sense of humor, or I'm kind of like this, you know, like, no, I mean, I don't know. I think I was expecting it, and I was like, the comic's a little bit confrontational. Um, 
but yeah, I did. I had one day where I sort of freaked out, and then I got over it. It's okay. It's to be expected. Um, so why don't we return to this? Um, so you draw this obviously in your piece. Um, do other panelists and maybe Joel specifically, because you sent me this image to have um, thoughts about um, pieces like this in Crumb's canon or this piece in particular? I think <clears throat> I think when you look at work, when you look at the body of Crumb's work, and this is to Tony's point earlier, um, I feel almost as if I feel as almost there is a sense of. I didn't mean this the way it came out with the way in which he portrays black people, but I believe that the way in which he portrays women is sincere. Like, I, I believe that that is sincerity. And there's an overlap with black women. Yeah, there's an overlap with black women, and I think that, I, I mean, I think that that's sincere. Like, I think that's, that's I think that's, that's worse, right? Like, the way, like, <clears throat> the way in which women, like, writing women and, like, clawing them and like, I don't know, bending them or not, like that's just, that's very grotesque and I just, that feels a lot worse than like picking up the tradition of drawing black people in blackface to me. I mean, it feels like it's, it's, there's so much more inherent danger in that um, for for women. Well, and while there is an inherent danger in the way in which he portrays black people, and I'm not trying to equivocate or saying one is better than the other, but at the same time, it does feel like the way in his, yeah, I have more problems with the way in which he portrays women, even though I'm just as passionate about how he portrays black people, but like, like women say, like, I'm just straightforward. If I was in a room with like, Hillary and Crumb, I'd be, I would literally be afraid to leave him alone with her. Like, that's just straightforward. I would like, I would want to stand there. Like, I would want to make sure I stayed in the room. Like, that's how I feel about it, because he's put this stuff out there. Um, and so like, that's the thing that I think about. And if I was in the room with Tony and Hillary, and it's not because Tony's a man, it's because like, I'm thinking about the, you know, like he's black, right? Is he gonna like call him, is he gonna call him a nigger when I'm walking in the room? Like, probably not. But like, what do you say? Like, so, I mean, I feel like that's the way I would, that's the way it sort of like, it gets in my head. Like, I feel like with from like, I don't know, like it's, and maybe this is like just paternalistic of me, but like I, I just like I feel like women would be unsafe in a room with him. Like that's just, like I mean, he just he's drawn this stuff that that feels way more problematic. I don't know. I'm getting an un articulate now, so like I'm just about to start grunting and going no. <laughs> <laughs> Else? Well, I feel like when he talks about his work, he talks about his work about women sometimes differently. He says, you know, this is, a, again, it's hard not to do, look at some of that bio and think of the kid who was abused, the kid who had a terrible experience through school. Uh, well, he, in the bio, he says that his dad used to beat him so severely that he broke his collarbone when Robert was five. Um, the anger, the mental, the mental abuse. His mom was an amphetamine addict at one point. The whole like lack of love and support at home that we, we then extended into their you know, going to school and being unpopular, being an outcast. And so there's a lot of rejection and rage and frustration that comes up. But whatever the birth, whatever the genesis of that, that it's in the work, you know. And with it, a lot of confusion and guilt and self-loathing, but the anger and the rage is very, you know, very real because he's such an amazing cartoonist. You can really feel it. It's like even when you do the stuff about Picard, you can feel the rage leaping off the page. And I think, and I think that is more deeply personal. Him dealing with his own inner demons and putting them on paper than necessarily the stuff about the war. Even though the other stuff re reflects this sort of misanthropic view of the whole human race and the whole world and society, there's something much more personal, much more visceral, much more direct about his problems with women. And I, I think when women react to that and sense that and are offended by it, they get it. I mean, they get what's there. They get that dark, negative side. And how people can just sort of say, well, it's just satire, you shouldn't let it bother you. Uh, you know, it, 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 even, even with the mixed feelings, I think that anger and rage is so palpable that it's got to bother. It, it's got, got to bother some people, rightfully so. 
How many of you would be surprised if suddenly tomorrow there was a news report that Robert Crump was a serial killer? <laughs> You know what I mean? That, that's literally like, that's like, I mean, it's like, when I get up my head, I don't want to, no, but, uh, but, but I want to be real clear, like, I was trying to figure out a best way to think about it, and that's sort of like the back, like, I would, like, I, I'm just like, that's what I, that's what I was trying to articulate earlier, like, like, I'm uneasy about it, like, I'm, un, like, a so, so, a sense of unease, I'm like, okay, so, like, can, I, can, I, can I ask you a follow-up question, yes. then? Um, you and anybody. So, I mean, in, I don't know how well you can see this from your angle, probably not very well, but like I pointed out, um, I just want to know what you think about this and if it changes your view at all about what this strip is trying to do. You know, he ends it with, why do I have this compulsion to confess? Guess it's my Catholic upbringing. A changed, honest girl that learned my lesson. Okay, so he's, confessing that he did this bad thing. He's also making kind of a joke out of his confession, right? Um, and this is on the first page of the story, too. It's, it's hard to read, but you know, he basically says, like, women are gonna hate me from now on after I reveal this. What do people think about that sort of framework of I'm confessing a bad thing that I did? Not that I'm just showing it, but I'm also confessing it and I recognize how bad it is. I think that by couching it as a joke, it's you know in, inoculating him from criticism so that when women inevitably come out and say like, this is offensive to me, then you're not like a cool girl anymore. You're not like someone who can hang and who gets the joke. You're, you're an angry feminist who doesn't have a sense of humor. Uh, uh, and he's like, yeah, he's like uh, protecting himself from that criticism in some way by saying like, I know you're getting mad about it. Well, it reminds me a little bit of David Letterman um, some years ago when he still had a show. Um, started one night with this cold over thing where he's talking to the audience and he takes them into this entire tale of how somebody was trying to extort money from him and did all this stuff and it's masterful the way he does it. And then so it ends with the police, him having the police arrest this guy and then the just tail end as he's going away. He was extorting me because I was sleeping with a whole bunch of women on my staff. But that becomes like a footnote because everything leading into it made you sympathetic to him. And so the headline isn't David Letterman was sleeping with a whole bunch of women on his staff. The headline was David Letterman courageously gets the police to bust extortionists. So in some ways, he set it up so that you will be sympathetic for him making this confession, which could be a real confession or not, I don't know, but, uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a setup, mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, sort of, all of the pages are set up, and then the delivery is like, like three panels, and then a further, like, sort of, lessening, you know, for the, a further jokiness, so, it's kind of set up to, to mitigate any, any negative reaction you would have to his behavior. Yeah. And then does it go anywhere larger to talking about other, all the other stuff? You know, it's this. So what do we make of the fact that um, so many really important cartoonists today who are women um, have been so influenced by Crumb? So for example, I've been really struck um, that, you know, Linda Berry has talked about, you know, Crumb showing her that one could draw anything in comics and how important that was to her as a cartoonist. Or Alison Bechtel um, saying that um, Crumb's work, um, especially his work with Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, encouraged her in a really profound way to be honest about her sexuality in her comics. What, what, what do we make of the positive influence that he's had on female cartoonists? How do we sort of reconcile these things? Can we go back to that slide that I Sure, um, which one? The one of, of them together, kind of grappling, yes. grappling with each other. Yes. I, I thought this was really important to bring out because um, now, uh, before I start, I'm going to say, to not bury the lead, Elite Kaminsky Crumb is the kind of woman he always draws. <laughs> she is the, she's sort of the model of his, of his, of his ideal woman. However, L like in this image, in it looks way, like it could be yeah, illustration. Yeah, yeah. So. With that in mind, uh, something to remember about him is that 
he collaborated with her on many strips. They, they became a couple, I think, in the early 70s. And they collaborated on strips where she would draw herself and he would draw himself. And it would, became a conversation between the two of them. Whatever, whatever bonding they had is shown in these strips. And they often joke in the strips about how, oh, Aline is always saying, oh, no one's going to like my style. And Crumb is always saying, Bob Crumb, R. Crumb, is always, gonna, is always saying, oh, your style is great. Like, don't, don't listen to them. You have this amazing power. So they had this collaborative relationship, which I don't think excuses all the other stuff. But it does cloud the issue more. Um, the fact that they collaborated on Weirdo and so many other comics, he really encouraged her in the early 70s. Um, and she formed Twisted Sisters with other women cartoonists. I think their relationship uh, um, empowered her. Um, and maybe you know more about the details of this than I do, but it's something that, again, not to mitigate everything else, but it's part of who he is where he recognizes, recognizes that talent. Um, and her work wasn't as popular as his, but, but it's maybe more influential at this point. So I don't know. I just, I just wanted to have that as a footnote. I, and, and I think just to sort of add to that, like I know I probably sound like you're like people like Joel hates Crumb. Like it's like it's like this is Crumb is just like everything else in our in our society. You're culture. welcome to hate Crumb if you want. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, but I want to but I want to be real clear about this. Like you know, I spend a lot of my time you know drawing comments about Black history and history in general. History is gray. Like it's not this or that. It is often this and that. Martin Luther King probably was a womanizer at one point, but he also was a great person to do what he did. I mean, it's like those two things can, can coexist. Like that, I mean, it, it coexisted because we tend to not think about these things in very um, complicated ways because we want them to be, I was thinking of this line from CeeLo Green. It was just like, think about something complicated. But he said, he said, you know, when he was with Goody Mob, he said, they don't want to hear the truth. They want you to lie to them, make it sound fly to them. And I think that's literally what we have to think about. Like we have to get past that being lied to, that it's either this or that. Like Thomas Jefferson was a great thinker. He also was probably a racist and a horrible person who owned slaves. Do you know what I mean? Like those two things can exist. And so in this, like Crumb can be, you know, um, progressive in his own way, uh, progressive about women in his own way, and have helped, a, you know, a plethora of, you know, uh, women cartoonists but also have a problem with misogynistic imagery and racist imagery. So I feel like that, I think, I want to be really clear, I think that those things can exist. Like, Crumb, and, and as far as I'm concerned, when, when we leave this panel, Crumb will still always be one of my artistic heroes that I have to add a comma after when I talk about it. Do you know what I mean? Our Crumb is amazing, comma. Okay, so um, we're, we're sort of sadly um, at time, but um, maybe we can just, have a few questions because we're at the end of the day. Um, you've had your hand up in the glass. Um, I want to say that I'm, as I'm looking at this pile of panel, I want to go right down the center by age. And the reason why I want to say that is I grew up on National Lampoon, the fabulous Fairy Creek Brothers, Ruby Health, all those sorts of things. Um, from uh, so in that pantheon, along with um, Boda, along with Boda and others. And the one thing that I take away from that is I'm looking at kind of you guys are younger and the problems you are raising are very different from the problems I faced as a younger woman at a time when his, the, I remember when that Big Brother album came up and how he drew Janis Joplin and oh my God, she was beautiful. Yeah. I remember that album came out in thinking, there's the drawing of this. Right, in thinking, here was a woman who had publicly spoken about how she always thought she was fat and ugly. And seeing that, and she was always one of my heroes as a kid. And saying, you know, looking at Crumb's work and saying, I don't have to wear house dresses. I don't have to get married and have children. I can be, like, you know, like as all these feelings are coming up in me, I was like, ooh, I can do that stuff, you know. 
And it really was very liberating. I think about Boda and how he portrayed women. I think about in, in all those National League Coon comics and everything. I'm coming from a very different perspective. Do I find Crumb problematic? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not, no two ways around it. But also, when you're thinking about it, also think from that perspective. Okay, so does anyone want to respond yes. to this comment? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, like it's, you're, yeah, like, um, I always think about this in terms of when, when we talk about, like, just how progressive our culture is um, and how, you know, like, in the context of, like, just society moving us back. And, you know, I think it's really funny that, you know, it used to be that we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't, you know, pinch a woman's behind on television. But you would do it, you know, and, but, but you would do it behind closed doors. And now it's sort of switched. Oh, it, it wasn't show. behind closed doors. <laughs> well, but I'm just saying, like, it wouldn't be on the TV. Like, we showed this wholesome 1950s, but we don't show what the 1950s looked like for everybody else, like, when you weren't watching television. Um, and so I think that that divide is, it's going to be clear because you know we're we're literally thinking about. I mean, we're thinking about these things in a much more open way than we've thought about them in a long time. Jessica, as the as the woman on the panel, <laughs> to this yes. particular um, comment about the sure, yeah. Well, um, uh, well, I also think that Crumb like ushered in basically, or you know, was hugely responsible for the whole corner of comics that I care about and have like dedicated my whole life to, you know, and it's impossible to disentangle him from the work that I care about, the work that I make. Um, but, and so I'm thankful for that. Uh, I also think that some of what has been ushered in is like uh, this permissiveness for like casual misogyny, like, well, at least I'm not decapitating a woman and like having sex with the body, you know? And so I can do this other kind of more casually misogynistic work. And so I think that, and honestly, I think even the field has changed a lot in the past decade, you know? If you think about like 10 years ago, things like the Masters of American Comics having zero, that canon defining exhibition having zero women in it. Uh, 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 like things have changed a lot in the past decade, but I think that, yeah, I mean, Crumb's work is important, of course, and also problematic. Okay, Heide? Um, sort of along this line, but I guess what I, I would like you guys to, to brainstorm a little bit about strategies, strategies for how to teach Crumb, mm -hmm. because, because I, yeah. I know a few of you are teachers of just thinking about how to, like, our students go and like, teach the word, yeah. um, look at a crumb image and they are, they are done, they're out. They, <laughs> like, you can't talk about it once you've shown one of those images. Like, and so... Why can't you talk about it? Because they, they just see them as so offensive. They just see them as pornographic and, you know, like, they... But there's no pedagogical way to, it, to make it a conversation. Yeah, I'm just saying, you, you brainstorm some strategy. That that, that, uh, I think one of the most interesting things about Trump is that he did usher in this kind of transgressive mode. When you talk about that, like our students are just so out of out when they see something different. I think um, colons are not just for our thesis, um, <laughs> doctoral thesis type papers. Like I think this is like the place where you use a colon. Like um, our crumb is a great cartoonist. Colon. <laughs> you got a lot of stuff. I don't class. show you, you have to show, I think you have to show I think you have to show other work first and like I show American Splendor first and then I talk about his other work. I mean I'll just say this quickly. Um I and my um teaching assistant for that class is here, Chris Fade over there. Um so he knows when I taught a graphic novel class at Harvard, I, I mean I decided to show what I consider the worst crumb images because I felt like if I'm not, I'm not actually teaching him properly in the context of the history of comics. Yeah, I like if I avoid it. And I, I did offer, I, although I didn't use this precise language, a trigger warning, you know, just a, a heads up. And I know that students really appreciated that. And one thing that was really interesting to me was that I had students from all different kinds of perspectives. Some, you know, some black women hated it. Some black women liked it. So I feel like, in my personal view, you have to teach those bad images with a lot of context. 
but I think it's important to teach them because I mean we're kind of so-called whitewashing a whole bunch of the history of comics if we don't do that. Um, I teach the history of comics, and I read. We read from in concert with reading other comics, but like women's comics excerpts um, and comics by women from that era. We also read part of this book, The uh, Pioneering Cartoonists of Color by Tim Jackson, where he talks about the history of blackface in comics um, to kind of like contextualize some of the work that we're looking at. And then we just have like really open and frank discussions about like what's happening in this work. How does it make you feel? If you hate it, why do you hate it? Let's just talk about it. Yeah, and I think it's really important, um, you know, just like you already said, I think it's really important to, I think it, I think it's, it, it's equally important to show the racist imagery that has existed in a way to design black people into existence. Um, because when you start to remove those things, you start to forget the impact. Like Tom and Jerry without like the racism that was just casually dropped into those cartoons is not as important. Like, I would much rather be able to show that because you can at least have a conversation. See, racism was so common at one point that it was just randomly dropped in the children's cartoons, like, and nobody said anything about it. But when you erase that, it's just like, oh, Nanny Two Shoes, she has different names, she has a different way she speaks now. Like, you know, like they just voice over. Like, I think all of that stuff is important in the context so that you have a be better understanding of how far we've come. Because if you don't, you don't realize how far we've come. You don't realize how, how bad it was at one point. So I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Emmy and then the person next to Emmy in the Army color coat. <laughs> um, I think this question will speak to the pedagogy question. Um, but there was a, um, a topic that came up earlier that we sort of moved away from that I think actually models how to talk in a um, productive way about um, about Trump. And it was the question of style. Um, it, it, it occurs to me that um, there's something about the realism of how he's rendering different bodies um, that makes the kind of essentially simplifying moves of a stereotype like really pop. So if you are representing everybody with smiley faces for and figures, then a kind of like um, stereotypical move um, that we see in his racial and like um, gender offensive images, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, be as offensive. So like do people think that the something about the realism of uh, the way he's rendering things in general is um, is part and parcel of why his work is so offensive. I mean, I think part of the appeal of Crumb is this like seductive line quality and his virtuosic drawing, and because of the appeal of the work, it has like a broader reach and more impact, which makes you know all of the offensive stuff have a further reach as well. I think Crumb's work, when I look at it, I think it's incredibly organic. His work lives and breathes and just has a sense of character. And I think the fact that it seems so organic makes it feel like it's part of the real world. And, and I think that that get, helps to give it its incredible power. I think a lot of other people, you look at them drawing, you're like, OK, it's you know standard figure. It, it's lines on the page. His work feels very different. And um, I think that that's one of the, the that's one of the things that's so beautiful and incredible about it. And it's one of the things that maybe also makes things that he does that are problematic resonate so much. Yes, your hand is up for Rob. Fine, OK. Um, I showed up to this specifically so that I would um, to offer a dissenting voice. Um, I think that it was actually wrong um, to have a panel about, uh, about well, any subject really, um, where the person who is moderating the panel hates the subject. But this is pretty much a kangaroo court. It's like a cultural kangaroo court where you present the. Okay, I don't hate like the subject. I can speak for what? I'm the moderator and I don't hate the subject. I thought that. Did you make a joke? Where you, where you said, oh, it's okay to hate him, or whatever? I said sure. that to Joel. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And I said, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I have a whole chapter on his works in my book, because I just <laughs> put it out at the beginning. All right, regardless, I think that it was heavily cemented against him. I'm not actually a giant fan of Robert Crumb's 
works, I think it is really not to my taste. But, what? Well, I think that's kind of what, my name would go ahead. But it's more than that, because this is, this is to do with politics. And the thing is, is that a lot of the arguments you, you guys presented, and it would take me an hour to talk about this at least, made no sense whatsoever. A lot of it was what about it. And some, some more of it was ad hominem attacks. For example, like in your, in your comment, you said that people were attacking you on an ad hominem, hominem level. You were doing the same thing in your comment. You were presenting all the critics as these stereotypical nerd, nerd bald and nerd guys. Okay, can we can we pause here and just yeah. let people respond? And do you mind sitting down? Because no, no I don't. That but I mean, see that I have else. so much to say, and I don't really have time to say. It. Well, I think what would be time. best then is if um, we could talk afterwards. But um, can we let people respond? Because we're already running over time. Um, I. I thought I was pretty clear that I didn't hate Crumb. Like, I, I said that it was great. I mean, I think that that's really more of her. And, um, it's just not true. <laughs> I, don't think that, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. But I think, yeah, I think, um, like, it's, I don't, like, nobody's on trial here. Like, this is, like, it can't be a court because we're not, like, nobody, there's no final judgment. We're not going to go, in conclusion, Crumb, you know, it's not that. It's like, this is literally, like, a conversation that's, you know, like, when you look at Crumb's work to sort of talk about um, what that work looks like um, from the point of view of, you know, me being, you know, a young black man who has seen Crumb, who didn't grow up with Crumb's work, and if you think about Tony being someone who saw Crumb's work when it was being, like, in the moment that it was actually, I mean, so there's like a... It sells Crumb's Yeah, it sells Crumb's work, and, 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 you know, like, the book was on the shelf, and I don't think, I think it's really important to remember that this isn't, like, I think Crumb is important. I think we should spend more time talking about Crumb. I think we should, we could talk about Crumb in a number of different other ways. And I don't think we should even, like, and it's not even always going to have to be about the imagery, the storytelling. Like, he's a master storyteller. There's a lot to, there's a lot good about Crumb that I didn't want to sound like I was, that's why I was trying to say that it wasn't great, because I didn't want to sound like I was hating on Crumb. I wanted to be really clear that this is not, you know, it's not about it. It's, it. This is great. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's not either or. I, 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 I mean, you know. I said that in, 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 in just to defend that comment because yeah, it was crazy, but I say stuff crazy all the time. <laughs> and, and, and I said that it's yeah. a debate about a debate, right? Right. And I'll, <laughs> in public yeah. And, I'll, and I think that when I said that, I was trying to because I was trying to clarify like how I thought like when I thought about crime in general like. That wouldn't surprise me. I said, I didn't say, from the series plus, like how many people would be surprised, right? Because I was trying to say that that's the way I sort of thought about it. Because the way in which he depicts women are the kind of things that serial kills have written about, right? It's like, that is like a clear, that is like, that's not an yeah, honest. sexually violent imagery. Yeah, the sexually yeah. violent imagery is something that you're, yeah. So like, I think that's the way I was trying to talk about this. And it wasn't, and it, you know, it was, it was over the top, but I was trying to, like, because I was having trouble clarifying what I was saying. I was trying to get a point across. Okay, we have one, one more question. question. And then we have to wrap up in the green shirt. I actually not not a question. I just wanted to thank all of you for uh, for doing this panel. Um, uh, recently, I was involved in a conversation uh, among a crowd of record collectors. Maybe some of you know Amanda Petrushik's book. And there's a whole there's a whole discussion uh, in culture in art. Um, it has to do with breaking down that, oh, this belongs to us and this is cool, and you're doing something different, and because you don't love what we love, you're not cool, that has created a barrier for women and for you know, all people, all kinds of people, um, to enter and, um, and to grow in. And I think, um, you are much younger than I am, but I feel so happy that uh, you're brave enough to have this kind of discussion. And that's what I feel like. It, it stirs up so much. But that's what this country needs in so many. This is a brave Thank space. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.